I remember just seeing them all the time, like, who are those guys? They are an anomaly. I don't feel like they purposely have been trying to be mysterious, right? They don't really look like a band. They do just like people who've been sort of let out for a day. What's going on? Oh, my God. It's insane, but it's fantastic. They would make really good Muppets. Um, okay, so back in the, the halcyon days of BC before COVID, um, we started, um, was it 2018, I think? And Tess and I have been working together on a few projects already. Tess was my wonderful uh, assistant. Um, uh, as um, Yes, um, we started working on a few projects together. And then when um, the Sparks uh, Brothers project kind of came to me uh, uh, through um, a couple of recommendations, which was lovely, um, I immediately was like, well, it's two-hander. I, I, I need Tess. Um, and um, uh, so we were... Um, uh, yeah, so we, we actually we had another assistant on for a little while. There was actually three of us working, Holly. And we do have to give Holly uh, a, a little shout out and, and credit okay. you um, for her in the very early days. So we, we were very fortunate to have a six month head start before the edit began. And which is, uh, you know, just very unusual, but actually gives the project the best possible start because you know, you need to gather as much as you can before day one of the edits. So they've got, they know what they've got to work with. Kate and I had been doing another project together before this, um, where I was working as archive researcher and Kate was working as archive producer. And Kate very wonderfully brought me in alongside Holly to kind of lay the foundation. Sparks had um, kept a lot of recordings off of the television or from um, bits and pieces that they had been given over the years. They shipped um, a few big boxes over from LA uh, to, to us over here. And so Holly and I were in the room together kind of breaking down all of this stuff. Holly built, um, uh, even built a little light box because we were given transparencies of photographs. Um, and we were like, well, how are we gonna be able to get these into a format where the edit can actually see them? We can give them official file names. So Kate kind of came in and gave us the parameters of how we were gonna work. So Kate would kind of go, right, we need to know the copyright owner. We need to know as much as possible what is in the clip and we set up um a farm maker. farm maker so yes it's all coming back to me now it was a few years ago a lot of things but um yes well we were all working a bit, even before COVID we were all remote so um Edgar was in LA partly in LA partly in in London partly in New York he was all over the place the producers were all over the place um we were London based uh, but we needed a system where everyone could see the archive and we weren't you know a Dropbox or we transfer or sh shipping drives it, it was just a little bit clunky and and and, and bitty and um we've been introduced to Farmaker uh, a system uh, for yeah digital asset management system um, which allowed us to basically put everything in one place upload it to the cloud and then um, Edgar could view it anywhere he could make his own notes um, you know he could tick tap tag stuff the edit could access it they could view stuff we could download screeners it was really good I mean it became humongous it, it mm -hmm. had so much material because Sparks, you know, stories over 50, well, the, the whole story spans 70 years, but, um, you know, there was a lot of material. Um, and so um, that was our first uh, real task to get it all in and under one roof that everyone can view and access. And and Tess really owned that. I mean, Holly moved on to the more production side after after a little while, and we, um, you know, Tess and I just then basically ran the ran the archive side together. And it was originally going to be a, a four parter, the ninety minute. Um, you know, quarter archive, quarter live, quarter interviews, um, and a quarter animation. Um, but it became much, much bigger. Uh, it became apparent that in order to tell the whole story, that the cover of the 26 albums, we needed a much longer film. And in fact, the archive 
ended up being over two thirds of the film. I think 80, 80 minutes of archive. 83 minutes. 83 minutes in 140 minutes of archive. So, um, uh, yeah, so it was quite um, a, a, a task, uh, but one that we loved, one that we- Yeah, actually- we just got stuck in making, and, and it was brilliant to have that kind of experience of uh, being a millennial and coming into this industry. And obviously I know I've grown up with computers and I've grown up in that world, but what I haven't grown up with is the older media, you know, the the beta SPs and the umatics and the all that lovely, wonderful media that I had no experience of or very little experience. I kind of just got the tail end of it. And so we were having to digitize things. We were actually, well, logging, and it gave us a really wonderful um, intimacy with all of the archive, but of course, none of it, we didn't know where, where any of it came from or who owned it. You know, we were kind of handed this wealth of material and um, some of it was logged, some of it wasn't. So we kind of had to lay the foundations of where we think things came from. And um, which was a unique gift to have, to know that things existed. But then of course it's all on, quite low quality um, formats, you know, like um, really old DVDs that were made in the early noughties or things like that. So then we had the challenge of, right, we've got the proxies, we know it exists. Then we head into the edit and we start whittling down what we're actually gonna use from, I think we had what, 8,000 entries into FileMaker towards the end of it. um, That was ranging from photographs to, you know, cards birthday cards that they had received letters posters, letters albums uh, album covers photo shoots mm. they had they had brilliant relationship with photographers mm. so it very quickly became um very naturally became we started portioning it up didn't we Kate as we headed into the edit mm. um well Tess became the um the 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 photographer whisperer she was amazing she because they are you have to handle photographers I mean obviously all archives you know you have to be respectful with and um they own it you want it um so you have to negotiate um but you know photographers particularly are very precious about how their their photographs are shown and scanned and and you know they want to touch them up they want you know so it so Tess was had a not an an, an enviable task of dealing with some of pretty tricky photographers but did amazing job and a sourced uh, contacts and outtakes and things that we were able to then almost animate put into a flip Mm. book thing and um you know so the photographs were a very big part of the of the final um film and um uh you know particularly in the early days because we didn't have any footage to illustrate we we only had one photographer who was there taking photographs of their early days so we uh had to um you know also yeah tricky negotiations but we we got there with all of that and because it was a a, a theatrical release of course um you know everything had to be scanned to the highest possible it's super high res um yeah and all the film and all the dvds had to be you know everything had to be blown up to as, as best as they possibly could so um uh yes uh yeah so i suppose circling back to the question how we actually worked together was Kind Kate, Kate kind of came in to set up the process and then I would be working away kind of logging everything and getting everything up in a proxy format and then we would head into the edit and they would say what they're interested in and Kate would then start the, the negotiations with the very big um, producers of some of this content you know finding people who you know there was one clip that Kate managed to find that took ages but we ended up putting it into the film relatively late um and it was the the beautiful you know my favorite clip in the film which is Ron in the bath in the blue bathroom and so Kate kind of took on the not enviable task of clearances and making sure that we actually found the right people to clear the footage with and then I kind of naturally progressed into the foot into the photographs and kind of being Kate's ears in the edit suite so I would work quietly in the edit suite and then I'd call her at the end of the day and go here's what they're interested in today and then Kate would go right and she'd be jump on her white horse and charge to go and find the people or find more and make sure that it was actually usable 
Well, it was it was a very much a a a, 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 a you know a two hander project, Definitely. and I couldn't have done it without Tess, particularly when COVID hit as well. I mean, that was mm. really really uh for everybody, you know. But we had to manage um you know uh we literally just locked pictures then, yeah. and we hadn't got masters in, right. and um yeah we had to then work out how we were going to get access to that. Getting and then shut down. Yeah. And also when it came to the negotiations, uh, initially they wanted it to clear for full theatrical. Then when COVID hit, they thought, well, the cinemas are closed. Actually, are we even going to have a theatrical release? And mm. there was that dilemma. And then they decided to go for a limited theatrical. So I went back and renegotiated with everybody for a limited theatrical. And then it changed again. And they decided, no, 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 we, we you know, we are going to have a full theatrical release. So um, that then came back and, um, uh, you know, we had... Um, a uh, uh, you know renegotiations again so um it was um constant and and um you know we, we had a great communication though it was mm. really lovely to be really collaborative with everyone it was a small team i mean there was um obviously Eg um, edgar the director then um wonderful paul truth the editor who um again tess and i uh, it, it's so wonderful working with an editor that understands how archive works Mm. and Paul gets it utterly and it and it helped us along with EDLs and and we had a great edit assist as well I mean that's the thing you you need a, it's great when you get a good team around you everyone understands the complexities of what archive is and how to get it and um you and know Paul they, did not once did not once in the entire production he never went to YouTube. He never <laughs> yes. ripped off the internet. He never thought that he could do it better. He would always come to me and go, right, Tess, here's what we're looking for. And then I would call Kate and I'd go, we're on this. And she and I would then collectively go away and think about things because it was quite a creative process of, um, okay, we've got to represent trying and failing. You know, the 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 amount of times that, Ron and Russell tried and then failed and then tried again and had success and so we would all kind of Kate and I would spitball about how we can represent that um so and then we'd kind of give them this hand over this wealth of archive in a very quick turnaround because we didn't have as much as we had this film was a long process mm. it was a long film so there was a lot to fit in. So we would be expected to be asked for something and then within the same day or the next day, hand over material that would- They were moving along every chapter very quickly. And at the same time, I don't know when Egg slept really, because he was also doing Last Night in Soho. So he would be, you know, when we had him, we really had to be on it and there and present um, and feeding him uh, things. And um, mm -hmm. he's got a really fantastic imaginative mind. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, his and it was the first time he'd made a documentary as well, which was really interesting. But what was fantastic was that he acknowledged that. Mm. He didn't come in going right. You know, I'm the big, big director. I know what he 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 acknowledged that this was the first time he'd made a a, a documentary. And and when we explained to him situations, he was like, okay, right, let's work with this. You know, he wasn't. He'd ask for a clip, um, but then you know we, whether it was the Terminator or Poseidon Adventure, he was very. You know, he loved his obviously loves his film. So we wanted a a lot of feature films featured in there as well. And there is a tie in with Ron and Russell being film students and loving film and all that kind of thing. So there was a lot of looking at feature films, but we only had a certain budget. I mean, our budget didn't rise when the the archive number uh, duration rose. We had the same <laughs> budget for 25 minutes as we did for 85 minutes. And um, so he he was very understanding that we just can't afford that clip of the Terminator. Like, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, let's find something else instead. And we did, and he was cool with that. And so, you know, we, um, and it was great that we had archives who allowed us to, you know, accumulate. Mm. Um, I mean, we it, there was also a heck of a lot of goodwill 
I mean, it, it was amazing when we first started contacting people, we mentioned Sparks and they go, oh, we love Sparks. And then it's Edgar Wright directing, oh, we love Edgar Wright. So everyone was really cooperative from Disney down. Disney were fangirling uh, the, the girls over there about, you know, um, Edgar and everything and, and Sparks. And Sparks having played at Disney World. One of one of the one of the um, people at uh, Disney had actually seen Sparks yeah. perform at Disney World at their graduation of their high school, and so that really helped. It really helped us. I have to say, you know, it's like we we you know we we had so much support and goodwill for this project that we were able to um, to turn it around. And the proof is in the pudding because it's been so great to hear everyone's feedback and they all love it they all it's a love letter from Edgar to the band you know wanting to shine a light on their genius and um and boy I think he did it and um it's it's really one of the the most joyful and, and fun things I've ever worked on so um so yeah it, it, I, I call it a poison chalice sometimes because when you don't have much to choose you have to work with what you're given and you're you're given these confines and you have to work within that but it's almost like what is it they say about choice that that too much choice is as much as a problem as too little and so it becomes this unwieldy beast where you've got this entire ocean of things and where on earth do you start and you have to prescribe some sort of mythology or methodology to it in order to get there well Edgar had seen everything and of course wanted everything and um as the as we progressed in the edit and and we started you know we we started I think with a 30 hour cut and we cut 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 and um and of course there were lots of interviews many more interviews than they had intended they they planned for 30 they they actually did 80 um and um and actually talking about where we had gaps in archives so it wasn't consistent so we had large chunks where we had lots and then we had areas where we had nothing and actually again one of Edgar's brilliant ideas was to well let's animate let's recreate with the art if we don't have it in archive we'll recreate that little scene on top of the pops or or, or um John Lennon watching top of the pops with Ringo Starr or uh you know be, meeting Alex Kapranos or however it is you know so those I think were just delicious to have those in there and it was actually then we didn't have to worry about that um what I found really challenging about the volume was that um as uh, we whittled it down Edgar didn't remove he just reduced so we ended up in some instances where two or three seconds um and as everyone knows when you're no negotiating with archives there are minimums, you know, you're paying for a 30 second or a one minute minimum. And uh, we had a particularly difficult situation with Danny DeVito on Saturday Night Live, where um, literally it boiled down to Danny's intro, three seconds. And Edgar just, just wanted it. He just, that was one of the things he just couldn't bring himself to lose. And we agreed, it's a lovely little, you know, piece. So it was a lot of pleading and begging and, and, cajoling and you know talking to the people over um lovely Leanne Platner who sadly is no longer with us and I gave her a shout out at the vocals actually because she did come through for us I mean you know it was something that you know she could have easily just stuck to her guns and gone no that's going to cost you 15 grand you know um but no she didn't she was very generous I mean obviously it wasn't just her decision but in the end we were able to negotiate a, a fee that allowed us to keep that in yeah so that's um, back for us yeah so um so you know it was it, chronological though wasn't it I think Ed, Edgar some directors come in with a specific vision of we're only going to do these these years we're only going to do uh the start of their career from birth to the first album or or they pick uh, a time and a place that they want to focus on and that can be quite helpful because then immediately it's it's narrowed down. Um, but with Edgar was determined that we would do this in a chronological format and that the music would be our map through their career, that it would be album by album. And he was very determined that no album 
however popular or however unpopular, every album was going to be covered mm -hmm. in this film, which was interesting for us again, because um, when you're mapping a biography or mapping a film like this, Kate and I would often start with, okay, are there any books out there that we can read? Um, are there any um, pre-existing documentaries that we can just sit and watch? And you start to build up this really intimate yet one-sided relationship with your subject um, where you know them, you know, like the way their eyebrow moves when they get asked a specific question, you know how they're going to answer a question before they've even answered it sometimes because they have these down pat responses. And what one thing that Kate and I often do, because we work together on a few different bio biological, bio biographical, sorry, mm -hmm. biographical um, films, is to, in order to kickstart that intimacy, we will print photographs of the people who we are going to become familiar with. So obviously Rod and Russell, but their band members, you know, throughout the years. Now, one thing that was interesting about Edgar's approach was that Sparks, obviously Ron and Russell have remained throughout, but they've worked with many, many different band members. So we had multiple faces on the wall that we then had to become familiar with. And that's when your photographic memory starts to come in and you start to be able to familiarize yourself, not just with the story, but with the actual what you're looking at. And then you can spot people in the background or you can. And it's only after, you know, six months of a research phase that you then can actually go back on stuff that you might have already watched. But because you didn't have that intimacy with your subject, you would have missed something that could actually end up being so integral. Um, and that's why that's the only thing I think as more and more and more documentaries come out. I read a really interesting article yesterday about how the approach to documentaries are changing because of the streamers and um how it's not becoming a bit of a factory but it's almost becoming uh, a necessity for those Formula, streams isn't there they, they yeah I read that as well yeah I know and and you know it is difficult because there's you know you're seeking for the you're seeking for the narrative you know obviously this is not a feature film. this is not a drama this is not but it is it's real life drama you know yeah. so you're seeking so it's often with the with, they do they script still and yeah. there are characters and it does follow a kind of pattern uh, of that you are creating a story and it has to be an interesting story and there has to be highs and lows and there has to be you know whatever there needs to be and if the story doesn't actually inform that you know what do you do how do you make it interesting and an engaging thing and um you know i mean sparks you know, Spark's story was one of of endurance, I think, mm. and and commitment, and 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 never wavering from belief in in oneself and doing your, your own thing. You know, uh, you know, Ron says at one point, "If you don't like us, we don't care." And genuinely, that's it. They just they just got on with it. You know, but um, you that know, was our theme. That was one of our themes because we had themes as well as photographs on the walls, didn't we? Yes, that's it. So yes, there were so many things that um Tess is so right when you're approaching a, a a subject and you have afforded the time to do this um and time is is so important you know um to, to seeking all these things out you know the books the the docs the pho looking in photographs of people in the background people that keep reappearing um old um interviews for sparks that had all their fanzines their early fan fan magazines that we read through and, and you know and these were all of, of of the time as well so it isn't retrospective it's of the moment so you know their memories it's in the now um and so all of that helped us to um to find people places things that that you know might not necessarily have uh you know you've got a mine for all of this stuff um and um you know that's that was essentially we did we we mined the sparks didn't we and um and, it struck and the themes revealed themselves as we went on didn't they that the, the we had that one theme of 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 endurance beyond that we also had themes of of relationships with people taking people along with you and not leaving them behind and um just multiple different factors that came into the story because without those kind of it's almost like having you know your your key mm. to the story 
Mm. Mm. That's how you're going to break it down. Mm. It's the yes, it's the jigsaw as well, isn't it? It's putting it all in in its place. So yeah, 